Hello. Hello. Thanks for coming. It's a great turnout. I think we haven't had this many people since the first uh, event. So uh, I guess you're all quite excited about serverless or you've heard about it. Want to know what it is? Uh, originally we had two speakers. Uh, unfortunately Anna couldn't make it. So we have myself. Uh, one speaker today, but we'll give a bit more time and you have a lot of time to ask questions. Hopefully that'll be useful. I can give a second talk about reason if anyone's interested. <laughs> <laughs> so um, we looked at serverless and we thought, you know, what, is, what does it mean? Uh, how can we use it? And uh, why are so many people talking about it now? And uh, Computer World gives this definition. So, Serverless is entirely focused on an output rather than the means to that output, sort of a high level overview of, of uh, uh, how we can think about it uh, when we sign an application. But from a developer's perspective, uh, it's, it could be like uh, Forbes says, developers need not rely on ops to deploy their code. This is like the I ideally what it should be like. Um, and I think that's why a lot of developers are <coughs> Are trying it out and they want to really make it work for for their applications but also from this uh, uh, the service provider so from uh, Google or, or Azure or, or, or Amazon uh, they say that if someone is using uh, just one process one uh, one CPU cycle even uh, and not a whole machine then we can pack more people into that machine and that means they can provide the service at a lower cost which is better for you because if you provision a VM you're going to probably use 1% of it, but you're paying for the whole VM and they're charging you for it so you'll think that they're expensive. Um, and uh, the co-founder of GitLab said that each uh, infrastructure paradigm improves application startup time by uh, 100 times. So VMs take 200 seconds to start, containers two seconds and, and with serverless you go to 20 milliseconds. And then, Unicornals. which is even better apparently. Uh, but also that uh, the same guy said that uh, serverless means someone else booted the JVM. <laughs> so now we're going serverless. Thank you. Cool. So many of you have heard the term serverless bandied about, maybe in a hacker news thread, maybe in some tweet, and you think, oh, what's this? What's going on? Is this one of those things that's only used by people in shortage of man buns riding fixie bikes, or is this something I actually need to care about? But you see the term more and more often, you start to worry. So just to ease your mind, you check Google Trends. Oh, oh no, it's got a hype curve. And if it's got a hype curve, it means people are going to expect to see it in your CV soon, whether it's useful or not. And you like being employed, so you panic a little bit. And you say, right, I guess I need to learn about serverless. But what is a serverless? How can you get one? And is this one of those things that, that we think, is this going to be one of those things that we think is a good idea for a while until we deeply regret it later, like OOP? So, <laughs> first we have to make a bit of a distinction. There is serverless, the framework, and serverless architecture in general. And before we can discuss serverless, the framework, we have to really understand serverless architecture. Right? With me? Okay, let's go. So, a little bit of history. Um, a long, long time ago, when you made an application and you wanted to share it with the world, what would happen is you take it and you put it on a physical machine somewhere, maybe under your desk, maybe under someone else's desk, which is known as a cloud. And, you know, this had its problems because, you know, it would keep you up at night, maybe the hard drive's full, maybe you suddenly need to give it a patch, maybe you have to bring it down and then bring it back up again, so maybe you want two machines and then your app gets popular and you're happy, but you're also stressed because now you've got to take care of multiple machines and if it gets really popular, you're stuck in this hellscape where your professional life is just this complete mangle of SSH terminals where you're viciously trying to keep your children from exploding. And as you manage your herd, you get more and more irate. You always say, I'm going to write a script next time. And you do. But the core problem remains that you have all these separate things to care about. And they're all different. They're all special. They all need to be updated and patched. And you've got to do it all manually. So you think, there must be a better way. I don't have to be a sad parrot all the time. And you end up mad in some basement lair, clutching a bottle of whiskey. And you go, aha, how about 
virtual machines. And virtual machines are great. They provide a snapshot of your, op like your OS in a certain state. You can have consistent deploys. You can have multiple tenants per machine, and that's really cool. But it's not perfect. You still have to patch the VMs, and you still have to worry about space and scaling, and VMs are kind of slow and take resources, and hmm, well, maybe, maybe containers. Containers are pretty cool. They're much faster, as mentioned, so we can start using them for things like testing instances and stuff like that, and you know, you've got quick deploys, and you've got images you can pull and push, and like, yeah, this is getting better, but they're not perfect. You still have to put them somewhere, and you still have to configure them, and if any of you have ever tried to configure a Docker Swarm, you know it's not a zero-friction process. So, hmm, wouldn't it be great if you could have something that just takes the code you want to run and not the boilerplate, and it's infinitely scalable, and it only runs when it needs to, and isn't that what serverless is? Yes. So serverless lets you run only when it's needed, just push your code out, uh, be, have trivial deploys or instant deploys so you can update things for everyone, roll backwards, roll forwards, and it's cheap. You can sleep well at night, your bank account can sleep well at night, nothing's going to blow up. But how on earth do we achieve this? How does that work? Well, let's have a look at what we would consider maybe traditional architecture, right? By the way, I stole this image from Martin Fowler. Uh, don't tell him, he'll mean tweet me again. So, this is a simple pet shop store, right? We have a client in the browser, we have this pet store server, and we have a database. And you know, requests come from the client to the server, the database is updated, goes back and forth, back and forwards. If you wanted to scale this, you would have to make more servers, more database shardings maybe, blah, 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 all very sort of, we've been there, we've done that. How would this look like in a serverless architecture? Hmm. You may be thinking, Marcel, you absolute idiot. This is way more complicated. But I assure you, it's not. What we've done is we've pulled out various bits from that server monolith into separate sections. And what we've utilized here are various backends as a services to make sure that we don't have to repeat ourselves. So let's take an example, an authentication service. How many times have we rewritten something that lets people put in an email address and a password, sends them a confirmation email and has a fucking reset button. Can I swear here? I'm too late now. Um, <laughs> um, and it gives them some sort of pass the reset functionality and you know, there's no, no store is going to succeed because they have an absolutely amazing registration system. It's just a chore we do, some gem we bundle in and then we deploy it and then we maintain it and then all the bugs are our fault. But why bother? Why not just use backends as a service and then use serverless functions to do the bits of functionality that we actually care about? So let's say as a pet shop, we care about the purchasing function and the search function. And we can say we can use API gateways to do our routing because routing is really hard, especially once it starts to scale in version. So let someone else take care of it. And the good thing here is when we have only small pieces of functionality we care about and we we can have these very, very small functions which are all independently hosted serverless functions uh, that we can compose together to make bigger functionality, kind of like functional programming, but on a DevOps scale. Um, and this means that we can also deploy uh, our unit of abstraction. So instead of doing whole monolithic applications, we're deploying individual functions, which is how we think anyway. And what we program and we compose and we can roll backwards and forwards and each one will individually scale. So you're never scaling a whole monolith. So for example, let's say you are a shop uh, that's having a Christmas rush um, so your checkout area is really, really busy, but it's going to scale the rest of the application as well, including registration. Even though there aren't new people signing up, it's all your regular customers coming in, just using their checkout section. So, that's cool. And you know, you get all excited. And you think like, yeah, this is gonna be great. I get to go to faster to market because I don't have to write all these extra things. And you know, development nowadays is all about speed. Speed of features mostly, but we also care about speed of quality and speed of security. Um, but by being able to focus purely on the things that we need to focus on rather than making registration secure and everything else, we get to focus on the quality of our individual features. Unless we happen to be the person making backend as a service, then that's our problem. But that's fine, we're focusing on a small subset. Uh, we have no scaling concerns, it can scale forever because more and more instances of that serverless function can be, uh, appear or disappear as needed. You have a reduced operational cost because you only pay it for exactly what you use. Um, you don't have to worry about patching, you don't have to worry about security, you don't have to worry about uh, the database running out of memory, it's great. And most importantly, we finally get that insane hipster cred that we've been craving for years. Hmm. Okay, but 
You, wait a second, isn't this just platform as a service? You've used Heroku. Isn't this just the same? And the answer is not quite. So with something like Heroku, you still have to worry about how many dinos do you want? Um, so that's kind of scaling in your turf. Um, you have monolithic units of deployment, so generally you push something out like a Django instance or a Ruby on Rails instance. And this kind of steers the technical decisions because you, it, you have to fit the kind of hole that these services provide. And they're always running unless you pay for the really cheap option, which has really slow boot up time sometimes. And most worryingly, you get no hipster cred. Okay, so. Some people argue about this. If you want to start a flame on the internet, try and uh, pe make people argue between platform and a as a service and serverless and <laughs> watch the flame war begin. All right, so you go on the internet, you're really, really enthusiastic and you go to AWS Lambda and you realize that all there really is is like this big text input box where you can paste your code, which you think is like, great, but I have several files on my application. How do I bundle them together? How do I configure all these backend services to talk to my individual pieces of functionality? Um, how do I monitor them? How do I log them? How do I debug them? And you know, when you have these really small functions that are individual and encapsulated, that sounds really good for testing, but how do you test them when they're always on the internet? And that is where serverless, the framework, comes in. So let's have a really, 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 really quick demo about how to make our first serverless application live demo time, so make sure to look out for the first breakages. Um, yeah, serverless create. Nope, there we go, first problem. Doo -doo -doo. Yeah, there we go. You can be ox. Can press command K plus plus. We can see it up. Ah, uh, how can we rate it? I can, I'll just... Hmm? Command, K. Command. K. K for ah, nice. Perfect. Free beer to the man at the back. All right. So here we go. We've just created some serverless files. Uh, so if we now go into our um, folder we just made, and obviously we have rad ASCII art, which is one of the other great tenants of uh, software engineering. Um, so we have basically some very small bit, just handler.js and serverless.yaml. And we're going to deploy this quickly, uh, and we'll look at the files that we do. So if we uh, do serverless deploy, and V for verbose, because we want to know what's going on. Deploy, deploy, deploy. You know, like, uh, uh, oh, I'm not on the internet. Is there a Wi-Fi? <laughs> <laughs> Please, indeed, and then the password is over there. Which one is it? Port Wi-Fi? What was the first word, sorry? Oh, oh the, all caps. <laughs> nice. Yeah, so, you know, live demos is something I'm trying to graduate away from, but I can never resist. And we end up in these scenarios. Do we have Wi-Fi? We do have Wi-Fi, excellent. Thank you very much. <coughs> anyway, so while this is doing the thing, um, let's go have a look at what the files is actually created. Uh, I think it's temp. You can all look at what I've got going on in my uh, file system. Talk temp, that's the one. Cool. Well, so it's actually a very, very simple piece of kit, right? Um, we have a handler, which is actually just our Langer function. And as you can see, the functionality here is just, uh, and I'll make this a bit bigger. Um, all you've got here is, hey, all right, we have a module. We're going to have a response when you ping us. It's going to give us status code 200, and it's going to give us a little message, right? Um, and the other part, the interesting part, the bit that binds everything together, is this little uh, YAML file, which is very, 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 very heavily commented for easy, you know, um, understanding uh, and for getting started. So here we say what our service name is. It's just Ox for Oxford. We want an AWS Node.js 6.10 instance. 
Uh, and the only other thing we need to say is like, yeah, when you get pinged, uh, run whatever the handler code is, which for us is just this 200 response with a string. No other things to need. We'll look at more stuff later. So how is our illustrious little package going? Uh, update in progress. You're making me look stupid. OK, so um, basically what it's done is, uh, what happens is it goes and creates all the cloud permissions that for you. So all the services you define in the YAML are getting made. And here we can see what happens as an S3 bucket is made. And your, each version of your Lambda is placed in an S3 bucket. So you can travel, traverse backwards and forwards for your different configurations and codes. Um, it also sets up all the IAM permissions for all the services that you require. So it creates an IAM user and then handles the permission creation for all the services you need. And it does it in a very granular way. So it doesn't do excessive permissions on services like that. It only needs to read from, it won't give itself write permissions, and so on and so forth. Uh, and it uploads everything else. It creates in progress, creates in progress, creates in progress. So you can see here is making a logging service. Here is doing all the roles. Um, it's usually a bit quicker than this. I do apologize. Hmm. So basically, every, every version of it is stored in a separate bucket. Uh, no, it's in the same bucket, um, but that bucket persists. But so how, how can reverse the previous version if it's the same bucket? Is the bucket set? Um, it's, it's, it's like, it's like um, Git, so each version is shard inside the same bucket. Okay. Uh, okay, here we go. All right, we've got some information, right? Um, what it is, um, what it's called, what functions we have. So now, if we wanted to uh, invoke that function, we could make an API gateway, but let's be, make it quick and just say serverless. Invoke the function hello. We do that, and we get back from the internet. Hooray! Like go serverless. We just pinged our function. So this is now infinitely scalable. We could all go there in our billions. Although please don't, my AWS bill. Um, although you get a million free AWS Lambda instances per month, so you know you can really abuse it to quite a large extent and never have to pay anything. Um, and you know, so this is really like let's say you've got like. 10,000 live users, and you want to update it on the fly, right? This is supposed to be the whole thing. We can deploy, deploy, do continuous deployment on a crazy level. So let's prove that to ourselves. Uh, what's everyone's favorite emoji? You're getting the rocket. <laughs> all right, so now if you just, instead of wanting to do all of that like CloudFormation stuff again, we can deploy individual functions, uh, which is also significantly quicker and will make me look less silly. Dum, 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 dum. How do you control which function you deploy? So here you can see we use hello, so that's the, that's the net functional name over there. But you always need to take care of what the function you have changed and deploy it one by one? Uh, no, it's much like, um, like uh, things that uh, observe ASTs, you can't have something that checks or changes and only deploys what's changed. But you can also have a Git-like effect where you can pick in an interactive way um, to you know, not push out things you don't want to, right? So now if we invoke that function again, hooray! So you know, this is obviously a very trivial example, right? But what we have done is we made an infinitely scalable function that we never have to take care of, um, that can be accessed by anyone, that will never slow down, um, which is, you know, very interesting. And we'll get onto some more complicated stuff later. Cool. So you, know, you think like that's great and whatever. And um, you know, it has some re like niche uses with very simple API stuff. But you want to look at all these backend services. You want to create a real business value piece. So let's create something that people in suits and ties will really enjoy. We're going to make something that takes photos of people finds their faces, figures out if they're happy or unhappy, and then puts emojis over the top. This has real business value. So here's an example. This is me uh, on a regular Tuesday uh, with some friends. We all have faces, and we all have emotions. And we're going to deploy a program that does this. <laughs> now you might think, like, well, I don't know. It's a lot of image analysis. It's going to take some time. But <coughs> I assure you, it won't. Um, this is going to be our general architecture. So we're going to have, and it's a bit simplified. I always think I should make this into an app, like some, some sort, so I can push a button and it goes through the flow. But we're going to have an S3 bucket of a folder. Um, we're going to put a picture on there. There's going to be this event that's watching that folder. So this Lambda will be invoked 
and pick up that picture and go like, okay, okay, um, I've got a picture, does it have any faces? Well, luckily there's a service for that, AWS Recognition, which is amazing by the way, more on that in a bit. But it can recognize everyone's faces, where they are, uh, whether they're happy or unhappy and how much. Uh, and then it'll give you back that data. We're gonna use another Lambda to overlay a little bit of uh, an emoji, depending on how happy they are, using a simple switch statement, and then put that back into another folder and we're done. So, very quickly, AWS recognition. Everyone remembers this comic, I'm sure. Uh, it bemoans how easy it is to figure out where a photo is taken, but then completely impossible to figure out whether a photo is of a bird. And AWS recognition launched in 2016, so you know they're about three years early because this came out in 2014. Just as an example, this is a picture of a bird. You've probably seen them before. Now, I can tell you it's a bird. AWS will tell you with 97% confidence it's a bird, but it'll also tell you with 97% confidence it's a sparrow, which is amazing. It knows species of birds far better than I do. Okay, so I'm going to take a picture of the audience and overlay your faces. So everyone pull, pull an emotion of your choice. So we're gonna, this is gonna process while we walk, look through the code a little bit. Okay. Click. There we go. All right, um, this is the, the ugly part where I go to Google Photos to... Uh, I don't think there's much of a range there. Well, I mean, this is just like... <laughs> obviously, the, it, it's a very miserable Tuesday. It's gray outside. <laughs> we need a few class clowns. Um, settings. Ba -ba -ba -ba. Back up and sync. Use mobile data to back up stuff. Yeah, go on, let's go crazy. Um, okay, so while that's doing that, um, let's have a look at some code, which I brought earlier. So it's actually not very different from what we had before because we utilize all these lovely services. So the face swap itself, and this is just a file that has emoji pictures in, so that's an asset folder, don't worry too much about that. Uh, the face swap itself is actually very, very simple. Um, it, <laughs> hey, for something like this, 200 lines of code to do every part of it is simple. Um, it's also some really bad code. In my defense, I didn't write it. Um, but it's literally just something that says, hey, let's get some images. If we see something in a bucket that turns up, um, or several images, we'll go grab them. Fine. Uh, and then if we have grabbed them, oh, not that one. Uh, we're going to use AWS recognition here to uh, figure out what the faces are and bring that data back. And then finally, we're going to just stick some emojis on them, overlay face of emojis, um, like getting the right size uh, and put it back in a bucket. So it's a very pretty much like a really crud application, um, as in the create, read, update, delete, rather than terrible. Um, but what's really interesting here is the server example, which shows you how you bind all these things together. So we have uh, emoji face swap, obviously that's fine. And we have the same things, like well, we have a AWS and we have Node. Um, but this is where it gets interesting. So here we start to like declare what kind of relationships we want to our services. So we have, uh, we want to be able to use recognition and specifically, we don't want the whole of it, we just want to detect faces. And obviously different kind of functions have different costings so this can be very valuable to control. Um, we want to be able to put and get stuff from, an, from a bucket. So we don't want to create, we just want to do that. Um, we want to also go to a particular name, and if we have templating, so we can go to particular buckets. Um, this is my little custom template for just not having to rewrite the same thing over and over. Uh, this is our function, so we do a bit of uh, specificity here. So we say, okay, we're gonna use this face swap handler. We're gonna say a time on a 30, cause it can take a little bit longer to do all the actual processing. Um, what extensions we want, um, where we're gonna put the folder we're gonna put it into, um, and our event thing, which is very important, because of course with serverless, it's going to be an event-driven program, right? Something has to happen to kick a serverless function off. Here, but the, the event is that, hey, something's been put into this uploads folder, something was created, then we're going to start this process. And that's it, that's all you need. And then you've got the whole thing going. So let's quickly check my Google Photos to see if uh, we've gotten somewhere. You'll also see other photos in there, so prepare yourselves. I think it's mostly from uh, the meetup yesterday, so it's fine. Uh, you can, oh, and my friend's ramen. Um, so yeah, you know, everyone, use, use reason. Um, 
bit of cross promotion there. Okay, so let's take this photo. Um, which you can't save image. All right. Uh, Oxford faces. Uh, and then, because I haven't made a, a cool way of like doing this yet. Oh no, where's my AWS tab go? Wah, 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 wah. Apologize for the wait. Okay, let's go to our S3. So I'm sure you've all seen these screens a million times. Um, and here's a thing called uploads. So uh, if you just upload a picture, obviously you can streamline this, you can use an API. That's, you know, like, that's a fairly trivial extension, but I'm just saying this is like the core basic stuff, right? You can get something going. Um, ba, 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 ba. Oxford Faces, that's you guys. All right. Watch it upload. Did it upload? Oxford Faces, that's where you are. Uh, Da, 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 da. Looking processed. Oxid faces. Ooh. All right. Hey! Oh, I did a pretty good job. You're right. They were very similar in expression. It didn't get all, quite all the people in the bag, but I think it's done a good job, except for this guy. <laughs> He's on another level. Anyway, like, so this is obviously a very silly and contrived example, right? Um, and that code was written very sloppily. You could definitely make it a lot more elegant and what have you. Um, but what it shows you is you can very, very easily make a service that does a thing using a bunch of other services in very, very little code indeed. So when you become like, and I'll show you how we can make this even more superb in a second. Um, so that's great. And you know, that kind of stuff, in, if you launched this like four years ago as an app, um, you would have been, you know, top 10 of the App Store, no problem, as a silly little waste of time. And here you can make it in an hour uh, on the internet. And if you just hooked it up to a camera function of some, you know, native application on a phone, you've already, you're, that's all you need to do, right? It's amazing, and it scales infinitely, and it's never going to go down. And you don't have to worry about all this other stuff that you would otherwise have to worry about. I will say, I stole this idea wholesale from a guy called John McKim who is very, very clever, and as you can see, very, very handsome. So if you're interested in this kind of stuff, do follow him. He writes really good blog posts. OK, so serverless, is it for you? Because I've been espousing about this, like, oh, it's great, oh, it's wonderful. But obviously, it has its drawbacks. So one thing is vendor lock-in. So technically, serverless works with things like OpenWhisk, and it proclaims things for other services, but you're pretty much set with um, AWS as a result. And things like Google Computer, like really making waves at the moment, they offer a lot cheaper, they have some really cool services. Um, you know, I'm using Google Computer at the moment as well, right? It's, it's got and Kubernetes and all that kind of stuff that integrates really well. Um, that being said, you know, it is a way of making things very, very quickly. And they are working on uh, plugins and extensions that you work with other things. They have made Azure work, but Azure is awful, so... <laughs> Fun fact, there's a hard limit of 50 instances on Azure. Um, OK, it's not feasible for long-running tasks. So um, AWS Lambda instances do um, charge by how long they've been running as a group, and there's a minimum time for each instance. So if you have really, really long-running tasks, let's say you're encoding something, then um, Lambdas aren't for you. Uh, it's going to become very expensive very quickly. But for lots of people who are doing web dev, which is like a huge portion of the community, where you come in with a response, you respond quickly, you come back, Lambdas are an amazing choice. Um, there is an overhead increase, obviously, because what happens is you go to the internet rather than going to your monolithic stack uh, on the same board. So uh, if you are like, you know, performance critical to the nth degree, you're doing embedded programming and stuff, obviously, that's not something that can be solved here. Uh, and something that used to be an issue, but really isn't nowadays, is cold start time. So lambdas have this concept of being hot or cold, depending on how recently they've been used, and depends on like, essentially where in the cache layer of the AWS ecosystem they are. Um, but even on cold start time, AWS and Amazon have managed to bump it down to less than 50 milliseconds, which is good enough for most practical purposes. Um, so that's kind of one we can scrub off the list, which is nice. Um, this is one of those things that uh, people like to theorize about, and you know, the question is always like, yeah, but have you actually used in production? Um, the answer is yes. So I used to work with this uh, drinking company of a software problem called Red Badger, and uh, we used serverless alpha in anger for a very, very, very large car rental company, and we loved it to pieces. It made life so much better. Um, 
you know, we're already like big on the Docker thing and all that kind of stuff. But serverless really helped us create applications with real speed, with like less overhead, less downtime, and it meant we could pass on something that was that required much less maintenance to the client in the end, right? If you just gave them a bunch of Docker images and go, like, here you go, you know, that's going to have issues in the long run. Whereas with Lambda instances, you can there's a large large level of assurance, unless AWS tanks, um, that things are going to be okay. Um, we really, really enjoyed using them. Um, we found them to be very, very useful, even back in the alpha stage when the API to serverless was changing constantly. Um, and there were lots of problems back in the day, like how do you manage secrets and other kind of stuff, but they've solved that now and in the like 1.6 or whatever they're in now, you know, all these kind of big issues are ironed out. Um, I will also very quickly say that there's a really, really healthy ecosystem for serverless in terms of plugins um, and in terms of templates you can use. So uh, if you go to serverless, GitHub, sorry, I should have put these up earlier. Um, you can see that, sure, there's this core serverless stuff, but it has this sort of very modular approach. So we have these, these what they call services starting points, so working with a secured API, uh, you know, DynamoDB streams, authentication, but do you want to make a Slack app, blah, blah, blah. But these plugins are where it's really at because they will give you the functionality pre-built to do all this other stuff. Um, things like .m security handling, um, support for different kinds of offline behavior so you can run your lambdas locally. Um, plugins for diffing, plugins for selecting. Um, the list goes on and on. It has a very, very, very healthy environment. So if there's something you need, someone's probably already written a plugin that'll help you do what you need to do. Did I see towards the beginning something uh, to do with uh, .NET? Oh, almost certainly. So it supports different languages as well. Oh, yeah. So oh, I, I should have mentioned this, I guess, because Anna was supposed to talk about it. So I, in our example, all our lambdas were in JavaScript, which is not to everyone's taste. Um, <laughs> but actually, it supports a multitude of languages, um, some more popular than others, like that's Python, that's Go, that's Java, I believe, as well. And they're always extending them. Um, you also saw, like, because I wrote this talk quite a while back, um, you saw, like, JavaScript terrible version. Um, but they now have, like, newer versions of Node, so you can write more modern JavaScript, which is much more functional and pure and less likely to make you want to take out your eyes. Um, so, you know, if you think it doesn't, there's going to be like a complication. Do have a look at the, at the community. It's very thriving. Everything that's really hard has kind of been attempted already. So you can kind of get on your feet. And like I said, we made a very large hour, um, which isn't huge, but doing a lot of very important transactions. Completely loved it. Did all the, the stuff that we needed to do. OK, so. Just a quick question about um, the language support. Yeah, go for it. For whiskey, I noticed, I'd have to look at the plugin, but um, I wouldn't be surprised. Uh, cool. Where did I leave my slides? Oh, back in the thing. Uh, blah, blah, blah. Just the one. Cool. Right. So, is serverless for you? Well, do you have an event driven application? If yes, maybe. Do you have short running tasks? If yes, Great. Do you have a man button on a fixie bike? Yes. Then welcome to the serverless hype train. <laughs> you can get excited with me, sleep safely at night, and be much cooler than your friends. All right. I've been Marcel. Thank you very much. Sorry if you're slightly around the candle, but okay. No, it's written by someone uh, who used to work for. Um, Repeat the question. Oh yeah. Oh, sorry, I completely forgot again. Um, it's been it's been a long couple of days. So the uh, serverless framework was not written by AWS employees. It was written by someone as a. Sorry, was the AWS was serverless written by AWS itself? Uh, no, it was written by uh, someone who worked for a uh, like a. Docker startup, I believe. I can't remember now, but they've since branched off in their own independent company, and they are there are several people working in it full time. How do you plan to monetize? I don't know, but they're definitely doing it. So you mentioned costs, uh, so, and of course it scales basically infinitely. Mm -hmm. uh, how do you avoid the costs increasing too much if your server gets slashed off the door? Can use or okay, so the question was, um, 
given that serverless costs, um, how do you deal with a sudden influx of users? Um, and so I think that's the same with any other um, like application. So you can put hard caps on your AWS costs, which can be enforced, which will be, or can be enforced, will be enforced, like they don't pick and choose. Um, so you can go and say like, I'll pay whatever you want, or you can go down, which is very similar to having a normal monolithic self-hosted application, right? You know, you can, like, if you just get too many users, you will go down. For things like DDoS attacks, uh, where your users are legitimate and someone's been trying to maliciously bring you down, uh, AWS offers lots of services through its gateway, for example, to mitigate that kind of stuff for you. Uh, that being said, you can put your cost quite high and you'll be surprised how many people you can serve. That's, it's okay, it just says thanks. All right. You mentioned um, vendor lock in as one of the cons. Yes. And when you were quickly skimming through the serverless stuff, it said it had support for the different mm. the Google Cloud and Azure and stuff. I'm guessing one of the difficulties there is when it comes to the services that are used. Mm. Are there any like attempts in serverless to have generic services like file created? It doesn't matter whether it's on S3 or whatever Google's one is and etc. Yeah. So the question was, are there being are there attempts to sort of genericize the services being used by serverless, uh, so it can be used on multiple platforms? The answer is yes, and they've made different levels of progress depending on user demand, because it's open source, of course, and uh, complexity. So things like Azure Functions and AWS Lambdas are very close. Um, but some of the open WISC stuff is more difficult, right? It's, it, it depends on what's available on the providers, but it's def definitely getting to that point. And there's lots of things like serverless that actually espouse like, hey, you know, we're, we're platform agnostic. Uh, that being said, if you want to be truly platform agnostic and safe, I don't think you can beat something like, you know, Kubernetes and Docker images. Are we going to turn the to serverless? As in the European one covered on the architecture? Uh, yes, um, oh, sorry, are there any alternatives to serverless? Uh, yes, and I've forgotten about all of their names. <laughs> <laughs> but certainly, there's one written in Go, for example, that I can't remember the name of, which I'm very sorry for, um, that tries very hard to do it. But I would say serverless is definitely the one with the best developer tool chain and the best experience at the moment. Okay, thank you. Uh, uh, the serverless framework, hmm. do they provide anything to create APIs as well over those Lambda functions? So the question was, uh, does it take anything to make API gateways or APIs, uh, public APIs available over those Lambda functions, yeah. correct? Yeah, so uh, Amazon provides a service called API Gateway, yeah. which you can also have as one of your dependencies in your YAML file, and you just say exactly what routes go to what, what um, Lambda services, mm -hmm. uh, and you can wire up your application like that. And of course, remember, Lambdas can call other Lambdas into existence, so you can have this sort of nice composed tree yeah. um, to get what you want. Lambdas, hmm. do we have any other service from different cloud providers which are close enough to make serverless in reality? Make serverless in reality. Um, so, can you repeat the question? So, I'm saying that, so over here you shown that <coughs> so AWS Lambdas can work like that and hmm. that could act as a serverless. So, is it like AWS Lambdas are the front runners right now or there are any other cloud providers? who have services which are better than AWS Lambdas or mm. could be better than AWS Lambdas in the future? So the question is, do other cloud providers have something that's akin to AWS Lambda and how do they stack up? Uh, all the major providers have something akin to AWS Lambda now. Uh, Google has them, Azure has them. Um, whether or not they're better or not often depends on whatever execution model that's black box underneath. So you, the best bet for like if it runs faster for you or cheaper for you is, as always, if anything performance, is to experiment and be empirical about it. There's nothing that says like this one's blatantly the best, to my knowledge. Mm -hmm. Yes, you. Uh, <laughs> uh, so you have mentioned about like uh, logging and debugging the, the function that is running. Mm. Uh, how is it done that you log from the function that is running on AWS? Or okay. How do you debug it? How, how do you log it? So um, how do you log uh, you're running a serverless function? Well, there's two approaches. You can have them be offline uh, and do them locally which now, which is nice. So you can investigate any sort of logs in real time. But you also have logging integration. So you saw it created, when it created the, um, the initial stack, it, it did some log stuff as well. So this gives you ability to tell those logs uh, in real time uh, to your terminal so you can see exactly what's going on. Uh, Debugging-wise, there's the ability to uh, analyze and breakpoint uh, your functions, both, again, locally, which is what I prefer, because obviously it's quicker, and it that means you can do it offline, uh, and on uh, the environment. So the local environment is, in fact, a very strong replica 
of the of the online environment. Uh, man in the glass in the back first. Uh, uh, a topic you didn't mention, and I don't have any specific question, but how does testing and things like that work on, uh, on, on serverless architecture? So how does testing work in serverless? So for example, you, you saw it there like in this particular example, it's a very, very small pure function and you write your functions and you would write any other sort of code function. So, you know, obviously it works best pure. Um, so it's easy to test and you can run those locally and you can put in new arguments. You know, you can, you can make a mock request object, for example, you put in and you want to make sure that all the right shape stuff comes out, right? So it'd be no different to how you would test other kinds of code. Obviously, if you're used to writing like things with loads and loads of a dependency ingestion, injection, like if you have like a really uh, side effect heavy Java project, for example, like you don't really tend to go down that dark route because you are forced to be a bit more um, encapsulated and uh, composable in how you write the code. Now the man in the beard. Oh, sorry, you didn't put your hand up again, but you did last time. Okay. okay. Uh, so you said that uh, serverless was not suitable for long-running tasks. Mm. Uh, is that something that's like of the current offers or something that may change in the future? So is, is serverless ever going to be suitable for long-running long, long tasks? So lambdas actually have a, like a limited lifetime. I put a time on a 30 on that, but I think the last time I checked, it was three minutes was the longest any Lambda can ever run before it gets killed. And I think part of the architecture of how do you achieve the costs and speed is to not have persistent instances. Um, I know they're always stretching it outwards in terms of time, but then it's never going to, like, not for a long time. They're not really designed or helpful in having extreme async tasks, as far as I know. And I don't think any provider is currently egging towards that market with Lambda functions. Oh yes, so there's, so there's lots of queuing and messaging servers, streams, kinesis, uh, all kinds of like various flavors of queues and, and data storage and like Redis equivalents that are very good and also at internet storage and also very affordable, right? So again, you'd, you'd rely on these other like backend services to do that kind of stuff for you. That's it. Talking about serverless, mm -hmm. given that it supports various different providers, um, does it have any migration uh, built within it. So say if, if, um, if you're using serverless with AWS, mm. tomorrow if you want to move towards Google, so is there anything that can migrate things? Hmm. Or, or is, would that be a big task? So the question is, is there a way of uh, migrating um, your, your application from one cloud provider to another once it's already been established? The answer is, I don't know. I haven't tried it. Um, I'm not going to feign knowledge when I have none. It would be a very interesting topic to see, though. Next time you can talk. <laughs> <laughs> Any popular serverless application? Uh, yeah, there, there's, there's a ton. Um, but and there's, there's a big list somewhere. Um, so I think I just look at those. Uh, sorry, the question was, are there any big popular service applications? Um, because today my knowledge for names has just like, completely dribbled out my brain. Sorry. Uh. Um, what are the uh, other alternatives to things like serverless? Uh, so, what are the alternative servers? Uh, as I told that chap, there's, there's a popular one to uh, call, um, which is made in Go. Um, but uh, yeah, sorry, it uh, escapes me at the moment. I gave a talk yesterday on Reason, and I haven't given this talk for a while, so unfortunately, I'm not as as hot on on the huge ecosystem. Um, we can all Google together. Um, yes, any other? Oh yeah, the awesome lists are always fun. You know, I'm sure. Um, They'll show you lots of good um, uh, like places that serverless has been used in anger. Lots of, you know, you can see there's, there's a lot of resources there to get you started. <laughs> um, yeah. Yes, sir. The support for various languages, mm -hmm. JavaScript, Java, Python, whatever. Mm -hmm. Presumably each of those has support for libraries, whether your own or third party. Mm -hmm. How does that work? And how do you get 20 millisecond startup time if you've got lots of external libraries? So how do we uh, you pull in our libraries and how do we maintain a good boot time? Um, so surprisingly, the size does actually not affect uh, the start time very much at all. So for example, um, people don't just put singular functions on to lambdas, they'll put whole express applications onto a single lambda. So for those of you unfamiliar, uh, like express is like one of the, the you know, uh, server frameworks that uh, is popular on node. 
Um, so, you know, with your node modules and everything together, that can easily be 100 megabytes, 200 megabytes. If you put that into a Lambda, it'll still boot in under 50 seconds and there's no additional cost. Now, that being said, uploading 200 megabytes every time is a real pain. So you can use lots of trimming and dead code elimination to usually bring it all the way back down to like under two, three megabytes. Uh, but no, so people just bundle their, their libraries straight in with. Um, as, as something they can reference in a folder structure. You zip a whole folder structure together, just push it up. You thought there must be some overhead there. If you've got a big library... It's, it's, it is surprising. Uh, so there must be some overhead, just as a follow-up question. Right? It is surprisingly minimal, and it's not something I've accounted for uh, at all and had not have any pragmatic uh, fallout from it. Don't know how they achieve that, but they seem to. If you want to, you can just make one really big node application with like, you know, a, a gigabyte of uh, node modules and see how badly it affects its boot up time, which is what I did, and I still managed to get under, under a very reasonable time. But if, if you have a, extending that, so if you have a Python module, you're mm. usually importing third party stuff, mm -hmm. that will go in your site directory. You don't upload that, do you? You just upload your Python. So if I, if I use a third party mm. library in Python and I run it, it'll pull it down for me. Mm. I can do a pip install. Mm -hmm. So, what's the recommendation? I, I write my Python app. Yeah. This is a third party. How do I get that up there? Uh, so, how does this work with Python? Um, yes, so you would, in fact, just do your virtual env, put it co located next to your project, and take it all as one big chunk wow. and push it up. Yeah, okay. So, is there any kind of like structure recommended? Because I can imagine if you do have like hundreds of functions, mm. you just want to literally like root them one by one. Is there any kind of like structure to make it clear to manage? Or it's uh, like right now it's like whatever you want and you do have like literally hundred files and every file contains a single function. Mm. So what's, what's the structure? Uh, best structure for very large applications. So generally, um, the idea is like you can try and split your application into as many like small horizontal, horizontal, vertical slices as possible. So you will have multiple files, and you can even nest files. And files can call files, and they can be dependent on each other in some sort of graph system if you prefer. But if you look at really large applications, you really begin to like start to slice off as if you're creating microservices essentially, right? Piece by piece by piece by piece. They are, they never end up being quite that large, um, and they're obviously individually deployable and all that sort of stuff. So you intend not to like have one giant mega massive application with you know a thousand endpoints being a single like serverless instance. Obviously like I said it's not good for every single purpose and if you do have one giant monolith like that's not that you cannot separate for whatever reason then you know obviously that's not a good fit but it is a good fit for lots of kinds of applications. Are there any open source cloud providers that uh, have are there any open source cloud providers that have serverless capabilities? Open WISC. Right. Is the standard that now JavaScript across both Amazon, um, Google, and Azure, or do we also have do we also provide other languages? Sorry, can you say that again? Do, do, do Amazon, Azure, and Google also provide other languages than JavaScript, or do you need to bundle it in yourself? Uh, so do do they provide other compatibility or languages on serverless with other, sorry. Do do the big cloud providers have serverless which takes more languages than just JavaScript? The answer is yes. Uh, each one has a certain level of providers. So I know, for example, like Go and Java and Python and JavaScript are all supported for AWS and they're always adding more languages. Okay. So uh, how do you manage uh, updates? Like when you need to do updates just one function, but is there any kind of routing? Like, I am routing this kind of canary builds to this kind of version, so I can see if it is working, not just everything. Is there any? Um, so how we do how do we do uh, like updates of individual services without breaking contracts with other services in a in an environment? So obviously you can run them all locally. Um, in of course, in a sort of continuous deployment aesthetic, the idea is that uh, you always just keep deploying. And you have you know tests that catch this, and you can roll back very quickly. And the idea is that you know your microservices should be independent; they shouldn't have the sort of things like we don't update them all at once. We very like you know each one has a contract, and there are contract tests to ensure that we get what we need. And obviously, you have staging environments. And the good thing about serverless, of course, because they're cheap, and you only use them as you need them, you can have infinite number of staging environments spun up very quickly, so you don't have to go straight to production. 
when calling um, services, do you have to pay for the wait time? Um, what do you pay for the wait time on calling the services? Uh, the wait time is very minimal, but no, you only run for the time, you only pay for the time that the serverless instance is running. But if you, if you have a call, the serverless um, specific um, like calls, like services, to um, basically something that sends a, sends a request and then receives the request in another function. Ah, okay. So uh, what, what the question is like, if you have this long async process, um, is that one idling serverless instance charging you? Well, you can, because it's event-based, you can have it not be based like that. You can say like, oh, you know, this serverless thing goes here, and when this done, it emits another event, and another serverless instance gets created that handles this in-between processing, this business logic of some sort, and then puts it somewhere else or delivers as a HTTP request or something like that. But this depends uh, on, on the providers of the services making something that um, behaves like this rather than just a... Yeah, a, all, nearly all AWS services have an event system built in, that yep. I can think of. They're not desperately trying to scam you, as far as I can tell. Cool, have I exhausted everyone? What's the next big thing? What's the next big thing? Unicorns! Unicorns. Um, it's going to be great. Then we can have 10,000 10, 10, instances on one machine. It's going to be great. Ah, okay. Thanks very much. No worries. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, oh, wow. Well, well thanks for our you know, <laughs> thank you very much. Cheers. Much appreciated. Thank you for listening to, me, listening to me ramble on for ages and ages and ages. Thank you again. That was a great introduction and uh, demos and everything. I hope you got all the questions answered. Uh, uh, I, I have more questions, but we can take them later at the pub. Um, so yeah, I just wanted to show you this that you've already seen. Uh, um, and uh, yeah, just reiterate, it's a great place to look at examples, just get started. Um, and um, with that, uh, it's time to say goodbye to Jonathan, so me, <laughs> and uh, welcome uh, Julian as our new co-organizer. Uh, and... Um, just on that. Well, we're here as well. Oh, wow. If anyone doesn't know the history of DevOps Doctors, some here have you been here since the start and some are new. Um, Jonathan is DevOps Oxford. He came up with the idea. Um, and, uh, well, he came up with Ansible Oxford and then Docker Oxford. Yeah. He came first. Uh, Ansible was a bit of a journey. Sounds like a meal, topic, topic itself, doesn't it? But, um, yeah, so it was, yeah, Jonathan is yeah, the reason we're all here. Uh, and I've, I've been here for almost uh, the last 18 months as DevOps Oxford. Uh, it's because of Jonathan, and he's going to London, and, and what I call the, the brain brain drain uh, down to London, the bright bright lights and the and the money, and uh, how dare you leave us? Uh, but, uh, but yeah, so yeah, so yeah, this is a, a thank you from us and wow. everyone else as well. Thank you very for, much, uh, and the best of luck with everything as well. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, yeah, so um, on that note, uh, we really want to um, you know, find the new topics and try to poke at things that people don't tend to talk about. So our next event, we actually need, uh, need your help to find speakers. <laughs> uh, so we wanted to talk about the new cloud accountants. So basically the people who understand how to control cost in the cloud. And as far as I know, no one really wants to do this yet. <laughs> but if you, if you have any idea, if you have any thoughts on this, if you know anyone that would like to talk about this, just talk to us. And we'd like to have a, a proper cloud accountant event. Yeah. Uh, and uh, also for a future topic, uh, we want to talk about DevOps in academia. So if you know anyone at university or you can think of any use case where this kind of way of looking at software and deployments uh, is used in uh, an academic setting. That would be really interesting. So yeah, just uh, send us a message. And now uh, off to Cowan Creek, as usual. Uh, this is a pub just up the street. We are, uh, we are here. And we're going here, actually. <laughs> <laughs> 
the now and you didn't know your way up. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I uh, hope to see you there. And uh, I might not see you next time, but uh, the rest of the team will be here. And uh, thank you for joining. Thank you.